Hello, welcome to the latest Hull Noir series of short author interviews with authors that we like. Uh, my name is Nick Quantrill. I'm one of the festival's co-directors and author of the Joe Geraghty series. Uh, and our guest on this episode is Stuart Neville. Um, Stuart is a prize-winning author whose work has been shortlisted for various awards, including the CWA Dagger, the Thiefston's Old Peculiar um, Crime Novel of the Year, and the Irish Book Awards Crime Novel of the Year. It's a bit of a mouthful in to get a nose out. <laughs> and if my maths is correct, The House of Ashes, which we're going to talk about now, is your 10th book, Stuart, including various ones under um, pseudonyms and the short story anthology as well that came out last year. I made it 10. I'm not sure. I think you're probably right, but I'm not actually sure. We'll, go, we'll go with 10. We'll, we'll go with 10. That's, it's a nice figure, 10. It's a nice double figure, so that, that's a good one. But um, yeah, so The House of Ashes, uh, brand new novel. Uh, it's a bit of a departure from the last couple of books that you've written under the Hill and Beck um, pen name, which were obviously big US set thrillers. And um, this is back to more kind of, I guess, familiar territory. It's, it's set back in Northern Ireland. Um, so why, why, why the move back to kind of writing under your own name and writing another kind of novel set in Northern Ireland again? Why, what was the prompt for doing that after those kind of big American thrillers? Um, well, I actually started writing this book before the two Hill and Beck books. Um, yeah. It was in the planning stages, but um, it was one of those books that had a very difficult birth and you know, it took several years to write. Which might you might be surprised it's only you know it's a relatively short book, but it um took a long time to actually get out there. And uh, so the healing back thing was kind of a, a diversion from this book, more than anything else. Uh, but it was also um it was John Connie uh used the line, I'm not sure if it originates from him or if he got it from somewhere else, but uh, that every book he writes is a reaction to the last. Mm. And um I think it's fair to say you know, the two healing back books being set in America. Uh, as kind of reaction against that, this book is probably the most Northern Irish thing I've ever written. Um, even compared to the earlier uh, Belfast set novels, I think it's more... Uh, I mean, it's certainly in terms of the prose and the dialect and so on, it's yeah. much more rooted in this place than the other books I've written. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? The, the book splits across two timelines, one contemporary, one goes back 60 years, but we'll, we'll pick one of those, but one of those is written in the kind of the the, the Northern Irish dialect, isn't it? That kind of Belfast vernacular. Was that very much, um, what, what was the reason for doing that? Because it feels like a bit of a gamble as a writer, you know, I mean, obviously it's not done people like Evan Wilson in has it, over the past number of years, but I guess it's a gamble as a writer. I don't know, it was what finally made the book work for me. As, as I said, I was struggling with this one. I couldn't quite seem to get a handle on it. I mean, it's something that happens to me quite often with the book is, it takes me a while to figure out what I've actually got, what it is. Mm. And I've been coming at this book from different angles. I couldn't quite seem to find what worked. And then I read a book called Country by Michael Hughes, who uh, is somebody I've known from years back. Um, and I sent a proof copy of that book, I think in 2017. And um, when I read that, and the entire book is written in Northern Irish or Ulster Scots to be, to be accurate to, uh, uh, dialect. Um, and I was saying, oh, that's it. That's what my book needs. And so it wound up with being those those chapters told from Mary's point of view. Her relating her experiences as a child are written in her very closely in her voice. Um, I, I guess as you clarify, it's not that it's uh, it's real kind of dense, mm. not even Irving Welsh kind of territory. It's still, yeah. I would hope, quite smooth and readable. Um, but there are a lot of words in there that are very much local to this area but in their context i think people will understand them i know yeah. american readers have, have no problem understanding it and so on um but all her all mary's chapters are kind of written in that kind of rhythm and the the kind of cadences of a of a spoken uh northern irish uh dialect. No, and it's not it's not a belfast accent it's it's a rural northern irish accent it's uh the accent that comes from uh sort of the county Armagh and uh, county down county tyrone that kind of middle stirred a the southern part of Northern Ireland, it, it, it's very much a rural voice rather than a, a city voice. Yeah, yeah, and no, as you say, as a reader, I didn't find it difficult to follow. Like you say, it's just picking up the rhythm, isn't it? The cadence of those words and kind of place them in the context of, 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 the, of the writing to be able to understand what they mean. And uh, but I think it did add a, some extra kind of colour to, to the novel. I think, you know, I think it was one of the triumphs of it as well, to be fair. So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, so yeah, see, so Mary's voice, we, we follow her story kind of in the early 60s, don't we, effectively in the novel. Um, but we also have a contemporary thread as well, though. It tells about the contemporary thread of the novel, which features um, 
a young woman called Sarah. Yeah, Sarah King, uh, she's an English woman from Bath. And she's married to a guy called Damien, Damien King, who's originally from uh, Northern Ireland, from the American area of Northern Ireland. And it, it kind of un unravels as the story goes on. She's been, he's brought her back to Northern Ireland after she's suffered some kind of uh, mental breakdown. And as the story unfolds, the reason for that breakdown starts to become clear as we see that their relationship is not a healthy one. Uh, that it's a relationship, of course, of control. And that uh, this move is just a further step in removing her and isolating her from her friends and family. Uh, so she finds herself in this remote uh, country farmhouse. Um, you know, no car, no transport, no communication with anybody else. Her husband's monitoring her phone constantly. Um, so there's a sort of sense of isolation. Um, and we, you know, we start to see the toll that that's taking on her. And then we, when we do meet Mary in the present day as an elderly woman, the, the book opens with uh, Mary hammering on the door of the house as Sarah's trying to clear this mysterious red spot that keeps appearing on her kitchen floor. Um, Mary's hammering, hammering on the door uh, saying this is her house and what's Sarah doing here and where are the children? And uh, and then we go back and see Mary's story and we see that she is living in her own kind of isolation in this mm -hmm. house 60 years ago. So the two stories unfold uh, parallel to each other. And, um, you know, as Sarah digs into Mary's past, she and Mary form a bond. And so that bond that both of them kind of finally find their way out of their own situations. And in Sarah's case, is finding her way out of this abusive relationship. In Mary's case, it's her finding a way to actually finally tell the story of what happened in this house 60 years ago. Yeah, was it? You mentioned the house. I mean, that feels like it's kind of the third character in the book into the third kind of central plank of it. Effectively, was that where did the idea start for the novel? Was it the was it the house? Was that the kind of the point that kicks it off, or was it more the characters that came first? It, it actually was the house, the house itself, um, and it was very, very loosely based on a real life case um, that happened here. I said very loosely. Uh, there was a murder suicide that happened here. Uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And it was a really horrific case. And I had looked at the idea of trying to do something based around that. But as I looked at it, I realized it was still too fresh. It was still too new. Wow. And I couldn't really, in good conscience, write about it, knowing that there were relatives and so on out there who would be still, obviously, yeah. it would still obviously be very raw for them, to say the least. Um, so I started moving further and further away from the real life case, but the idea of the, of the house where something dreadful has happened remained. And that's where it kind of stayed for a few years. I kept trying to find what that was. And as I said earlier, it was discovering Mary, first of all, discovering her as a character and her voice that opened up that portion of the book. And oddly, the present day story of the book was a completely different present day story when I first started writing this. And I actually sold the book to uh, Von Ayers Afra, my publisher, with an entirely different present day story. <laughs> okay. um, uh, and it was actually a Flanagan book, a continuation of the Flanagan detective series that I've been writing. Mm -hmm. It was her investigating this arson at the house, this, the, 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 the fire at the house. Um, and I kept coming back to it, like, even after I'd sold the book and we we're just coming up to start editing, and I thought, I'm not happy with this. I'm not... This isn't what I the book that I wanted to be, to be. And I called my editor at that time. Um, I should, just since we've done with Catherine Armstrong, I'm, I'm sure you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I explained the situation. I said, I, I want to go back and want to rewrite this from scratch. And she agreed, and so my agent and so on. So I basically scrapped half of the book and started again with Sarah Keane's story. And all of a sudden, everything kind of clicked together. And worked in a way that it hadn't done before. Um, and I was able to get the fact that I had wanted all along of these two stories intertwining and one informing the other. And as, as you read one chapter from Mary's point of view, it tells you something about Sarah's time. And you read something from Sarah's time and it tells you something about Mary's timeline. You know, the, the two kind of weave together until everything kind of coalesces at the end. Um, so yeah, that didn't that didn't happen until actually quite late in the day uh, after the book was sold. Like we just went back to the drawing board with that section of it. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's not really a book that needs a police investigation. I don't think is it? It's, it's about those two women, isn't it? And how their their kind of their lives mirror each other. Don't they? That sense of 
um, you know, like um, Sarah's in a, a like you say, an abusive and controlling relationship, but Mary's relationship is kind of is more. She, she's kind of t- they're taking a slate at essentially, you know, that she's held against her will along with other girls in this house sixty years ago. But yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of parallels there between their, their lives. Yeah, and 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 the idea originally with the police investigation had been trying to sort of uncover something that had been buried here in this house, but. Um, yeah, for me, it worked better when there were when there was a kind of present day mirror to Mary's story, albeit, albeit maybe not quite as extreme, but still horrific. Um, and the as we learn from as the story goes on, the situation Mary is in, she's a child of indeterminate age. We think she's in around eleven or twelve, that sort of age, uh, living in the dugout cellar of this farmhouse in terrible conditions, along with two adult women. We're being held there by a father and his two sons, um, essentially as slaves. And uh, we know, we learn earlier on in the book that something tragic has happened as a result of this. And then the rest of the, the story kind of teasing that out and figuring out what that was. And um, it's a truth, you know, the truth was never discovered about it for 60 years until this moment when Mary now is finally ready, able to tell the story. Yeah, was it difficult capturing Mary's story? Because we spoke about capturing the voice, didn't you, of Mary, but actually capturing her sort of journey across that period. Because I'm guessing with Sarah's story, it's a contemporary story, isn't it? So there's kind of things you can you can hook onto, like, well, we'll talk about maybe a bit about her father-in-law and her, and, her, and her partner. But for Mary, it's a completely different scenario. Is that more? Does you have to kind of was that more kind of research to kind of get into that type of that character, that type of character, and their sort of circumstances? Uh, not so much research. It's more. Um... In some senses, it was easier to write because she exists very much in a bubble. Mm. Her entire universe consists of this house and the yard behind it and what she can see from the front windows because she's never stepped yeah. outside of those in her, in her 12 years. And her sense, one of the things that, that I've tried to is her sense of the outside world is almost kind of dreamlike. She knows there are other places. She, know there, she knows there are things like radios and televisions and cinemas and boats and airplanes and other countries, but she doesn't actually really have an accurate idea of what those actually are. And there, there are a couple of moments where she imagines, she has this drive, this desire through the book to someday go to the seaside. Mm. She wants to go to the beach and see the sea because she, she'd never done it. And she imagines as a child going to the beach, standing on the shore and being able to see London and America and Africa from the beach, all these other places that she knows exist, but she has no real world sort of uh, uh, no reality to kind of to, to, to bring to mind for those. She only has her own imagination. Um, so there's some parts of her world are kind of dreamlike. Um, but the, the one thing I was very, very careful about through the book, and I was, uh, I some of those very meticulous about, I didn't want the story to dwell on their suffering. Those women, I mean, it's clear from the story those women have suffered horrendously. But I, I've never been interested in kind of um, the kind of salacious thing of, of taking yeah. a magnifying glass to suffering. It, it doesn't do anything for me as a reader or a writer. And it becomes far more about their relationships, um, the relationships between the two adult women and their relationship with Mary. Um, there, this, there's this question mark over who's Mary's real mother, for example, um, that kind of thing and how these different women deal in different ways with their circumstances. And then a, a kind of a hand grenade is thrown into everything when a, another young woman arrives called Esther, who has been tricked into coming to work as a housekeeper in the house and finds herself in that situation as well. And she isn't going to take it lying down. And that is kind of the catalyst for everything that happens after that in, in Mary's story. But at no point, I, I never wanted to dwell on the suffering and the indignities of that, it's more about how they relate to each other. Yeah, I think it's their humanity, the humanity, isn't it? I think that comes across really strongly in the book, that sense of um, the, the, the bond between those women and how they kind of deal with the situation is really kind of the strength of that, that particular storyline, I think. Thank you. Um, well, that, that's that's what I was going for. Uh, it, I wanted to show those relationships and, and how they sort of keep each other alive, basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there is violence, but no violence comes. It is, it is brutal. Um, I'm not making any bones about that, but it, that is not the purpose of the story. Mm-hmm. It's not. To the, I, I've never. I mean, although there's quite a lot of violence in my books, I don't think they're quite as violent as people think they are. Um, 
I'll take a tangent. I remember um, quite early on in my career, I did a library event with Owen McNabee at Derry Central Library. This is going back probably more than 10 years thinking about it. Um, and I read a, a scene from my second book, uh, uh, Collusion. And um, there's a scene in which the contract killer, the traveler, um, sees him to the back of a man's house and kills him. And I read the scene, and I remember a woman coming up to me afterwards and saying, that was, that, was, that was very good, but that scene, that was terribly violent. That was shocking. And I had to point out to her, there was like two sentences of violence mm-hmm. in the four pages that I'd read. Everything else was the anticipation and the atmosphere of violence and the, the dread of it. But the actual act itself was all two sentences. And which tends to be the way I write. It, it, it's, it, it's not as focused on the actual violence, I think, as people think it is when they actually drill down and look at it. Um, it's always more about the aftermath of violence, the anticipation of violence, the threat of violence, rather than the act itself, which to me is far more interesting than, than just describing the brutality. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think that kind of threads across the book into particularly Mary's storyline. And, and, and in Sarah's as well, that, that sense of any violence in there is end, isn't it, in that sense? It's not. It's not good. She would just, just for the sake of kind of trying to grip a reader in that sense. It's much more psychological, I think. And that's kind of, again, another strength of the book. I mean, you know, if it had been that kind of excessive balance we've spoken about, then as a reader, then I just wouldn't read it. It would interest me as a reader. And I think the book stays firm on the right side of the line on that, which, um, which, which was good. Um, one thing I wanted to touch upon, which you mentioned there, was about, about reality of the characters, about Sarah's reality, well, about particularly Mary's reality, because obviously, you know, as you say, she's kind of in the house, you can only see out the window. But there's like a there's a paranormal thread running through the book as well at the same time, isn't there? There's kind of Sarah and Mary both kind of interact with things in a slightly different way. Was that is that kind of did that kind of come out of this, their story that that paranormal element was it because of their the way they see the world and the way they're interacting with it rather than a maybe sort of like a deliberate choice to bring a paranormal element in? Or was it the, maybe the John Connolly influence possibly? Uh, John Connolly influence, Stephen King influence as well. Um, yeah. It just it just felt right for the story. Yeah. Um, anything I write will always be driven by the story itself. If I if I feel the story merits supernatural element, then it will have a supernatural element. If I don't feel it mm. deserves, it, don't feel it merits it, it won't. It, um, and to be honest, it's something I kind of moved away from over several years. My first couple of books, in particular, had a very strong supernatural element, in particular, twelve yeah. slash the Ghost of Belfast, um, including the title and that one. Um, and that, yeah, that's really a product of my reading growing up. I mean, I grew up in the 80s, so I read Stephen King. And you do, it was the law at the time. And um, that has stuck with me. And as I said, moved away from that over recent years, kind of more because I felt, almost I felt like I, I, I needed to avoid that stuff to keep it pure crime. Yeah. For the sake of, for the sake of genre, of categorizing it in a, bookstore shelf kind of thing um and doing the two heel and back books which are very straight thriller it was coming back to this but what it really was actually was i, I did a short story collection uh last year uh, called the traveler and other stories um it's available in paperback uh from zafra and with that i was I went back to some stories i'd written quite a few years ago on some new stories and i was finding in those i was coming back to the supernatural stuff this mm-hmm. this kind of great kind of hinterland between horror and thriller and I uh, was really enjoying it both writing it and reading back over it and that kind of re- realization that I could actually miss that part of storytelling kind of freed me up to use that in this book and uh, for Mary it's part of it's her kind of childishness you know she's only 11 12 and she has uh, I don't want to do a spoiler, but she 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 has an experience that kind of opens a door for her into another world, or a door for the this, this whole world coming to her the, in the in the guise of these children. The children are the children that've been in this house before her. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things we 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 kind of that suggested as the book goes on is that Mary and these two adult women aren't the first to have been there. Um, so Mary encounters these children. That's her play in the shadows of the house. And she becomes their mother, for want of a better word, as she grows old in the house, um, the children remain with her. And uh, 
there's a line when 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 Sarah and Mary are bonding where Mary tells Sarah the children will find you when you're ready and sure enough they do um and I don't know I, I don't know how readers respond to that I, I, I think there's an approach within publishing that that crime and horror can't intermingle because crime is very rational whereas horror is irrational but in my experience most crime readers will have read horror in their time as well. I mean, I'd yeah. struggle to find a crime writer, crime reader these days that hasn't read Stephen King. Um, and almost, I think every crime writer I know has, has read Stephen King and has read the horror genre. Uh, I don't know if that's true of you or not, but... Um, I've never been a huge sort of reader of that type of stuff, but it, it, within the context of this novel, it felt like the, the lives that those women were living in the novel would open them up to those type of experiences. And, you know, it, it felt completely natural. It wasn't something that was kind of just shoehorned in to kind of be a cross genre thing. It felt like it came out of the characters to me as a reader. Yeah, and again, it comes back to, it, it felt like the story yeah. wanted that there. I said, if it, had, if it hadn't felt like that, I wouldn't have used it, but it's, it's for me, it kind of, I think that was another reason why the book all of a sudden started working for me. Uh, when it came back to it was that, uh, having said the side several times, was that realization that it could have that element in the book uh, to work, and that can, along with Mary's voice, that's kind of what finally gave the book the form that it needed. That w- where I'd been struggling with it before. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And another thing that I particularly liked about the book was the way that um, we meet Sarah's father-in-law in the book, that we Francie, who's um, and there's a very kind of it's, it's kind of quite subtly done in the book that you, you know he's ex-IRA and he kind of still he still wields an awful lot of power within his community and within his world, doesn't he? And that kind of I don't, has there been a, a sense of a shift in writing about what we would what we'd call the troubles in, in, in Irish novels? You know, it seems to be more about how, how it's always it's still there, it? even though we kind of nominally have peace, you know, despite Brexit and, and the issues come up around borders. It's still there. And I think, you know, the novel really brought out a sense of, um, of those kind of like the after effects of, of what we've had since the post Good Friday Agreement, possibly. Is that something that kind of is on your mind as a writer, particularly, you know, writing these type of novels? Um, yes and no, which is not really the answer. Um, <laughs> I think it's a, I think that it, the dealing with the aftermath of the troubles, I think, is something that's starting to really happen uh, uh, in a serious way now. Yeah. Um, I think of uh, the Last Crossing by Brian McGilloway. Yeah, yeah, Brian in particular. Recently, and, yeah, yeah um, Sharon Dempsey who took Eden Mulligan. Um, Claire McGowan has also touched on the, the, the disappeared, which is a yeah. terribly soft phrase for people basically murdered, murdered and buried without the killers letting their families know where the bodies are. Um, and I, I think we're, we're starting to see an examination of the troubles now. I, I, but I feel like I kind of done my bit in that with, with the 12 yeah. years ago. Um, so that kind of really kind of focusing in on the troubles as a subject matter. I think, I think I've done that for now. I may, I may well come back to it at some point, but um, for me, tackling it as a subject is, is pretty much done for me as a writer, but at the same time, you can't write about crime in Northern Ireland and not brush up against it, particularly if what you're writing uh, brings in any elements of organised crime, um, because organised crime and paramilitarism go hand in hand. The kind of structures that uh, the paramilitaries set up during the troubles still exist. This idea of cells and so on, and, and chains of command. You know, they're very, very similar to mafia, mob kind of chains of command, and um, in the similar cultures of America and so on. So, if you write anything at all where there's some kind of hint of organized crime, that will be paramilitarism. So there's no escaping it, and it's it's you can't. As much as I think, I don't think I've written a book about the troubles in 10 years, but it's always there in the background. There's always some element of it there. It's simply because it can't be escaped um, in real life or on the page. Um, but it's something I've written about, I've, I've sort of written about more recently is um, trying to get past the, uh, Oh, I want a better word, prejudice that there can be against fiction set in Northern Ireland. And I've had the feeling that that's been broken down 
to some extent over recent years because we've had so many uh, crime dramas like uh, The Fall and um, The Secret. Uh, there's been Dairy Girls in the comedy front. There's the new Kenneth Branagh movie, Belfast. And I hope, and I, I think, and I hope people are maybe more willing to look at Northern Ireland as a setting. It doesn't necessarily have, doesn't necessarily have to be stories about the Troubles, but um, just people waking up the idea that there's a part of uh, these islands that has a lot of stories to tell. Mm. That's whose voice has been ignored for quite a long time. Yeah, and when we talk uh, about Nordic Noir, don't we? When we talk about Iceland and the, and the kind of number of writers per head there, but you know, Northern Ireland must be kind of right up there as well, because you know it's an incredibly incre huge in volume and huge in quality as well. And as you say, there's a, a lot of diversity within within that pool of writers as well. I think. Yeah, well, uh, Adrian McKenzie and I um, some years ago now we edited uh, Belfast Noir. Um, the you know the Kashuk yeah. series of noir anthologies, which mm -hmm. will focus like a Berlin noir and a, a yeah. Boston noir, you know, anthologies set in specific cities around the world. And we were asked out at the Belfast one on this back then, that's not very long ago. There was certainly an imbalance then of male to female writers. We we started at Belfast and kind of worked our way out geographically, and we filled up the male roster almost immediately, but we struggled to find female crime writers. At that time, the, the, the yeah. ten anthologies being written, so we were bringing in um, uh, women writers from further afield, from, from the Republic, or maybe from other genres. Uh, uh, we had uh, Lucy Caldwell, for example, who's a very much a literary writer. Mm -hmm. What a brilliant story for that. And the streetwise again in here. But what's happened since then is there's been a big surge in female crime writers here. Um, now we had Claire McGowan back at that time, but since then Claire Allen's come along, and Sharon Dempsey, with Kelly Crichton. Um, you know, I could go on, I could rattle off. And if I, we were doing a Pelvis Noir part two, we could fill that list yeah. instantly with great female writers. Um, so that's been a brilliant thing to see. Um, but also more male writers have come along. Um, like at that time, uh, that anthology had Steve Cabin's first published story before even the first, his first novel came out. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting with that anthology, there were 14 stories in it, all set in Belfast, all crime stories all completely different yeah and that was the thing that really struck me about it was when i was going through is every single story had its own unique voice and perspective and uh completely different subject matter and for such a small city a city you can walk across in 10 minutes um you know city center you can you can walk from one west belfast to east belfast in a matter of you know half an hour um for such a small city geographically to have such a diversity of stories that can be told about it um, really brought home to me at that time is how rich a seam of storytelling we have here. And I, I, I do feel like it's time that had its day, you know. Excellent. Yeah, I think, I think my introduction to it was Colin Bateman's work, you know, back in the, we went back to the 90s, aren't we? Effectively, there with Divorce and Jack and those novels, which were, you know, it was, it was kind of you know, mind blowing to me to read a book about such a serious issue, but told in such a comedic fashion. You know, it was kind of, it really did kind of, you know, expand my horizons as a reader, I think, with that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I read I reread Divorcing Jack when I was writing the Twelve, actually, um, and I was kind of remind myself that the, you could have a book about Northern Ireland and with the troubles as a thread running through it, and it'd still be entertaining. Yeah, as for still to be a fun read, which which Divorcing Jack was. So that I think that's a, that Divorcing Jack is real uh, kind of tentpole uh, novel from Northern Ireland. In fact, I've, I've got a piece coming in the Guardian, so ten books from Northern Ireland, and, and Divorcing Jack is one of the one of the most important books. And that list I put up there. Fantastic. So before we finish, what's next for you, Stuart? What are you working on at the moment? What can you tell us without breaking <laughs> confidences? I can't say too much. I was working on quite a literary kind of thriller mm -hmm. that I'd done it for a chunk of, but I kind of ran out of steam and I, I had, a, had to have a sort of a, kind of a crisis meeting with my editors and ages before, uh, before the holidays there. And uh, I basically set that aside and started an entirely different novel altogether. Um, that could not be more different. <laughs> so that's just, I guess that thing of every every book you write is a reaction to the last. Mm -hmm. um, and this is very, very different. It's it's going to be set in the States again. It's kind of maybe, maybe getting back to some of the Hale and Beck territory, but under my own name, and all, but also bringing in a fairly strong supernatural element as well. And different characters, presumably, as well. New oh, yeah, different characters. Yeah. Completely, completely standalone. Right, fantastic. Brilliant, Stuart. So The House of Ashes is available now. Um, 
I think it's a triumph, Stuart. Well done. And I think it'll be one of those books that we see in the end of year book list without a doubt when we get to Christmas 2022. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Nick.